I view the British contribution, if you want to use that word, malevolent contribution as, as one of the most dangerous things that the West is doing at this point. It's backed simply every single bad judgment about, about Ukraine all along. And that goes way back. I mean, we've the Washington, America has inherited this 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 ancient hysteria about Russia. And do you think that this entire um, Syrian Syrian offensive that it is it a pure coincidence that this is happening at the very end of Russia's presidency of the BRICS? Or is this something that Erdogan could have had on the top of his mind? Because, you know, by the end of the month, uh, Russia will will not be heading um, the group anymore. Uh, it's going to be Brazil next, if I'm if I'm right. not wrong. Um, yes. So within the BRICS dynamic, this is quite important because the 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 presidency with the rotating presidency is the one that basically coordinates all of the Sherpas and is the one that then recommends, uh, well, recommends who could who could be considered to join or not. And and of course, I mean, there's no central secretariat, but the presidency is the closest thing we've got to a organizing uh, body. Um, and that one rotates. So the fact that, that Russia is out now, that might play actually into the hands of, of Turkey of, of continuing its relationship with it, all while also continuing its NATO uh, membership and actually showing the NATO alliance that it's it's a useful member, yes. right? Yeah, uh, the calculus is very difficult for both Russia and Turkey. But as I say, I think in the long run, the Turkish-Russian relationship is probably more important than the Turkish-NATO relationship, which has not really brought Turkey much reward. Um, and it's, in fact, NATO, I think, is in this very strange situation of, of Americans and some Europeans being quite infuriated at Turkey's rather uh, loose game, uh, being willing to buy Russian defensive missiles uh, expressly against NATO's wishes. But ironically, I think that NATO needs Turkey more than Turkey needs NATO. And um, I, my sense is that, long sense is that Turkey will probably place greater weight on its relationship with Russia and figure that it can get away with that unless it commits some egregious act. And I, I, I don't foresee that at the moment. I'm not sure that the timing of Russia's presidency is really a factor uh in this uh, situation or even trump's presidency um or i it's very difficult to say what all the factors were in russian thinking but i think they were quite wise in deciding not to become involved as a nation as opposed to let's say a, a BRICS member were wise not to become involved in that they they just don't need that uh, I don't think BRICS wants to get into those kinds of situations if it can possibly avoid it. I'm not sure. I haven't thought all of it through, but I'm not aware of any situations where you have BRICS members at loggerheads with each other. There may well be. And if there isn't now, it will surely come in one degree or another. But I think BRICS is definitely not in the mode of of, of collective security or security arrangements. It's much more a developmental uh, and working towards peace, which which can attract any number of players rather than getting into the the uh, security game, which of course is, is Washington's favorite game and only game in, in many senses. The question is whether BRICS will remain operational even when member its members are at loggerheads. Um, and the the BRICS approach so far has been to build to build infrastructure, right, or to envision infrastructure. And you just mentioned the T word, so let's go to Mr. Trump because Mr. Trump said recently said some things surprising to me. Is like, okay, uh, if if BRICS wants to move away from the U from the U.S. dollar, then he's gonna put like uh, huge tariffs on them, right? And if they dare to create their own currency, which by the way is is a, is a, 
nobody wants to create their own currency in BRICS. I mean, that would be a stupid thing to do. Uh, you don't want to emulate the Europeans with the euro. That's a, that's its own disaster uh, unfolding. And I think people see that. But for some reason, uh, Donald Trump seems to believe that that it is possible to threaten uh Everybody inside BRICS, which which at this point is like half the globe, basically, just with right. China and, and India alone, right? Nearly, nearly that. Um, how do you think the Trump administration is now is now reacting or working um, with with this emerging alternative? It's 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 often repeated, like BRICS is not anti-Western; it's non-Western. But that's maybe something already that the Trump administration um, seems to look at as an insult. Yeah, I wouldn't put too much weight on what Trump says right now, or indeed much of the time what Trump says is is kind of thrown out there to see what the reaction is. It can be braggadocio. Um, I, I agree, it was a very challenging in your face type of remark back to BRICS. I don't I think it was a sort of off the cuff remark and does not necessarily represent a carefully considered policy. I mean, he's not even in in power yet. So uh, I, I don't think that we're watching firm. I hope not. I hope we're not watching firm uh, policy set in stone towards the rest of the world. There, there are a lot of other people. I mean, I, I, one of the figures that interests me a great deal is Elon Musk, because I think Elon Musk in many ways represents a, a real world view of, of events um, that could that's very important to check on perhaps some of the more ideologically wilder positions that some of Trump's other appointees have put forth. So I do, I'm sure that 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 uh, Musk would not advise Trump to to come in head on conflict with BRICS just as the whole thing is barely getting off the ground. Um, there are lots of things that I think ill considered. Throw remarks just tossed out that I don't take too seriously yet, anyway. But even if the remarks um, are maybe not to be taken too seriously, the appointments or the the intended appointments, I mean, the announcement of the people that he wants in his cabinet, those people strike me as very, very important because they are the second in charge that are going to commandeer like very, very important parts of this administration. And despite all of his promises uh, to appoint or to to work, not work again with the with the, the neocons as before, he never said out, out he never said he would not work with neocons, but he said he wouldn't re uh, appoint the same people as before. And he actually ruled out Pompeo and Haley, which is which is great. But now he brought in Waltz, he brought he br brings in Rubio and so on. What do you make out of this? So are we just exchanging one group of neocons for another one now? I, I don't know that I don't think anybody really knows yet. But we do know that Trump has a history of mercurial actions and uh, quick appointments that were often ill-fated. I mean, we can remember how quickly uh, he changed secretaries of state, uh, moving from, uh, I forget the name of the guy who was the uh, former uh, high-ranking uh, uh, oil executive uh, who was really out Peter of his own depth. Yeah, and then bringing in the, the uh, unspeakable Pompeo, uh, but even Pompeo was at odds with him. And it's interesting we can see now Pompeo excluded. I, 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 I don't, there's, there, there's so much um, contradictions, even within the appointments that we see that Trump has made. Uh, some of the appointments I find appalling, but you never know when somebody gets into positions of power and responsibility that their views might change. But yes, I am appalled at the Secretary of State, I'm appalled at Waltz, I'm appalled at, uh, at uh, the uh, new National Security Advisor. There's some guy called uh, uh, Agurka or Agurka, who was a real neocon on a lot of the Middle Eastern situations. But then we have, um, uh, we have um, Ron, Ron, um, um, I'm blanking at the moment. The, no, the no, uh, the, the very uh, Ron Paul. Paul. Oh. 
Ron Paul, who is a very libertarian, who is very much opposed to war and hostilities and involvement in these things, who is is if you is on the side of peace, if you will want to use that term, and also um, Tulsi Gabbard, it's very much out of that uh, mold. So, and I don't know who else may be advising. I again, we don't know what what Musk is really whispering into Trump's ear, but I'm glad that he is there because I think he's a more responsible, non-ideological voice um, in all of this. Now you so anyway, I'm just saying there's a there's a mixture of 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 groups within his appointments who are at odds, very deeply at odds with each other ideologically and stylistically. Do you think this is by design? Do you think he's playing this? He's trying to mix together a cabinet that's going to be at each other's throats, so it's easier to manage all of them. I mean, that could be a strategy, but maybe that's like over, over, overestimating his. his um... No, no, I I laugh only because I think it makes some sense. Uh, I think there's been some sort of demoniac uh, logic to many of these appointments. Uh, some of them, I think, he just threw out there to uh, to appall the, the liberals uh, and to soften them up so that when he gets around to the people that he'd much rather appoint uh, later on, at that point, they will have fought so much against his earlier appointments and, re and thrown out so much ink on those appointments that they will settle more gladly for the follow-up appointments. I don't know. Um, there's a famous uh, Chinese uh, proverb of saying that Uh, kill the monkey. I mean, sorry, kill the chicken to scare the monkey. Uh, in other words, if you do something terrible uh, on something that's less costly, you may scare others into doing the actions, taking more. So I think I think some of these earlier appointments, maybe I'm naive, I don't know, were designed to, to appall uh, liberals and others and soften up Congress to accept his later later nominations but who knows he's trump yeah and yeah. and by the way i should just add that's one of the things that i almost view in his favor slightly is that when we look at people like harris and biden we know what exactly their policies have been and will be if they had come into power or stayed in power on the way. And at least from my perspective, I was intensely opposed to those policies and any number, I'm talking foreign policy primarily, I was opposed on any number of, of those issues. But with Trump, I we can't say that we know exactly what he's going to do. If there's any silver lining to this, it may be that he's gonna change his mind, he's uncertain, um, there's a kind of uh, madness to some of these appointments, but that's better than known disaster uh, that I think came with the Trump Biden with the uh, Biden Harris uh, team. How much power will the Democrats have to um, to be a pain to the new administration and to derail? Um, maybe policies that they know that the Trump would like to enact to be um, to be uh, constructive, right? I mean, one of the things we know is that the Democrats are dead set to try to uh, continue the war in Europe, right? They're trying to shore up right now as much uh, as much support still for for um, Ukraine and as much um, insulation of NATO from anything Trump could do, and provoke the Russians into, I mean, really like to a point that even in the Cold War was unthinkable, right? Direct strikes against Mother Russia uh, and and hoping that Russia then overreacts and that would that would justify an all-in uh, NATO invasion. I mean, it's really, really, really dangerous. But do you think they will try to continue this game under the hood um, with the Europeans in because there is ways to fracture the, the US, uh, um, not just politics, but but the what you can do with the admin, with the administration, right? Right. Um, I think you're you're correct uh, in your analysis, Pascal, that this is really a kind of desperate last minute effort on the part of Democrat, the Democrat and, and the Biden administration to put facts on the ground or facts into concrete that will complicate, uh, if not wreck, 
any aspirations for change that, that Trump might have. But once the Biden is out of power, uh, I think the situation changes a bit. And uh, this r recklessness of Biden, last minute recklessness, may uh, be harder to maintain. Uh, and also, I mean, you even find people like uh, J.D. Uh, JD Vance, um, who is very much opposed to the to the war in Ukraine. So I think they're important and Trump himself. So I think they're very important players. And even though there may be many Russian uh, hate run, many Russian haters, many Russian bogeymen, um, they may not have the same power once um, once uh, the new administration is in power and the new Congress uh, is in power. And hopefully the British element that we didn't we haven't talked about that, but I view the British contribution, if you want to use that word, malevolent contribution as, as one of the most dangerous things that the West is doing at this point. It's backed simply every single bad judgment about, about Ukraine all along. And that goes way back. I mean, we've the Washington, America has inherited this 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 ancient hysteria about Russia. I mean, you know, this this goes back Deep in European history, when you know when when the Eastern and rest, Western churches broke from each other in 1574, whenever it was, um, uh, into Eastern and Western churches, Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, that infuriated the West. Um, the West, had, when 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 the Communist Revolution came and in, in in with the Bolsheviks, um, that really upset the the capitalist class in the West, uh, the, 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 the United States has always been terrified of communism. Uh, the British have always been terrified of Russia as a geopolitical opponent. I mean, this goes back hundreds of years. You know, Russia threatening the, 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 the uh, British hold on India. They were fearful that the Russia was going to come down over the, over the mountains, over the Himalayas, and seize India. I mean, this has an ancient, ancient uh, 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 background and history to it all. And the U.S. has just bought into this continuing almost hysterical uh, phobia on, on Russia. Yeah, but it, it's, it, it's gotten us closer to a nuclear exchange in Europe than ever before. And let's talk about the Europeans, because and I am Swiss, I'm European, and I can't believe that the entire <laughs> Western part of this continent seems to be willing to risk a nuclear exchange in Europe, you know, in Europe especially the Germans, who should be highly aware that their forward deployment of like US troops is, okay, it's a tripwire, the Russians wouldn't dare, but if the Russians dare, then they are all dead. You know, it's going to be, it's, it's an all or nothing game. And if it's nothing, it's especially for the German nation, going to be nothing at all, right? Um, how do you explain to yourself that much suicidal, like, I have what to call that, like trigger happiness, like, okay, the Russian roulette, the European Russian roulette that's going on. Um, how does it make sense to you? Pascal, I agree with you. I have real trouble in trying to understand this. And I've asked a lot of my European friends and people who follow European politics. I think there are several factors involved, none of them, which I, none of which I find fully satisfying, but for one thing, um, European membership in NATO has been extremely convenient. Let the U.S. do the heavy lifting. Let the U.S. bring it, bring all its arms here. Let the U.S. protect us. Let the let the U.S. pay for it all. And of course, as we know, uh, Republicans and especially Trump has gr grumbled about this as to why are we paying for what for what is essentially a service to the Europeans. Secondly, I think Europeans, I hate to say it, but I feel in a sense are just fat and happy. They don't need to worry about serious geopolitical issues that are serious and require some uh, sacrifice, perhaps financial sacrifice, strategic sacrifice. Um, I feel somehow that the European leadership is one of the most mediocre that I've seen anywhere in the world. 
I mean, when you consider the, I, 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 I'm, I'm no admirer of Russia as such, but when you consider the quality of, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a uh, diplomat like uh, Lavrov, uh, or even Xi Jinping on the world scene compared to the real pygmies on, on the European scene, um, who seem barely in touch with what's going on, that's another, another factor. I think just Europeans have been so socialized into playing, doing the U.S. agenda as long as they are one protected and two, they don't have to pay for much of anything. Uh, and the Brit and the British who feel that they're somehow, you know, riding side saddle to the American power, just showing that Britain is still a power in its own right. All of these factors coming together that make them really overlook, I think, uh, blindly, stupidly. But you're you're right. Um, that's the best weak explanation that I can come up with. Poor leadership, laziness, and and um, saving themselves from some money, and also U.S. pressure. I mean, this U.S. pressure is not to be downplayed. It's, it's, it's very, very considerable on all of the European states. Right. Um, at the same time, what we are seeing is this onslaught in the media, right? Uh, in, in mainstream media. And, uh, you know, I was never this uh, desperate about it as I am now, because it seems to lead Europe into down a very dark path. And I don't only mean the, the, the risk of war. I mean, what we are seeing now, what's happening, I mean, again, how Georgia is being reported on is appalling. Uh, and what we are seeing in Romania, We've just had the Romanian uh, a democratic election cancelled because the wrong guy won. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is a lapse back, and 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 mainstream media sells this to us as a correct co corrective measure, right? As you know, when when democracy doesn't produce what it is supposed to produce for both cases, Romania and Georgia, then well, then uh, higher. It's it's important that higher forces step in. Uh, in in the Georgia's case, like the protesters, right, F whom we, we still need to learn where where they are all coming from, uh, and secondly in Romania, like the 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 courts, the courts that well, they're color, and, they're, uh, color they're, they're color revolutions, the color revolutions, yeah. So, um, isn't there a huge danger that Europe is just like uh, is is going is going down a a a anti democratic spiral right now from which there's no 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 recovery? Pascal, I think you've put your finger on a very, very serious question, and I've been puzzling and deeply concerned about this myself, starting, I guess, when it first came vividly to my attention was with the onset of the war in Ukraine, when I began to observe, well, I've never had that much respect for the foreign policy views of the New York Times, which have generally been extremely anti-Russian, extremely anti-Chinese, extremely pro-Israel, and uh, a number of other things. But it, I, became, I became aware that gradually the U.S. press, once that, war, once that war in Ukraine began, was all beginning to sing out of the same hymn book. And suddenly you began to, you know, I generally would look at the, the Manchester, at the Guardian, which I would assume was rather independent, or the BBC, or all, not a bit of it. I mean, all of these, these media have fallen into voices, single voices that all echo each other. There's no light eff effectively among them. So I think something much scarier is happening here. There is some kind of broader media control. I think it's coming out of the United States in particular, but it must find some resonance, resonance in Europe. That means that we have very, very little opposition um, press, opposition alternative voices, and you are one of them. You are one of them, and there are people like Chaz Freeman and Judge Napolitano and uh, any number, uh, any number of other people are bringing alternative voices. But you, you have to know about these voices. You have to search them out, if you will, to find them, to to be informed by them. But otherwise, you can read any old newspaper in the West now, and almost any old newspaper in Europe, and read exactly the same thing, like it's coming out of Central 
central, uh, what would you go, like some kind of Moscow uh, line uh, about, about the Western. I think that's exceptionally dangerous that we do not see serious divisions among among Western, mainstream Western media on, on vital issues, as you point out. What scares me is that I don't think that this is centrally controlled, even though there are obviously interests and obviously CIA and and other like uh, uh, intelligence or uh, organizations in the U.S. strategically leak certain documents, which then New York Times and Washington Post pick up, and then that's put to Ro that Reuters picks it up, and then downstream the Europeans pick it up. I mean, the chain, the chain of the food chain is quite clear, but it's not centrally. Uh, governed which then leads me to to think that this is an ideological moment this is this is willful uh, uh marching in order which is what sometimes happens when when ideologies like take over and they are very destructive i mean we've seen what the what what, what ideology did to the chinese right great leap forward fantastic or cultural revolution fantastic we've seen what it did to russia when stalinism uh, reign supreme and, and how many millions of people internally it killed. Uh, ideology is very, very dangerous. So uh, do you see elements of this happening to European society right now? Maybe much more than the, than the Americans, because the Americans to me seem much, much freer in terms of, you know, <laughs> actually discussing uh, and, 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 and opposing each other in the political process, whereas the political process in Europe is, 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 properly frozen in place together with the propaganda. Yeah, um, I, I think one reason, of course, is that the US is much bigger and probably more diverse in general <clears throat> um, and does, has not had the terrible experiences that Europe has undergone, which I think perhaps brings a greater caution and fear. And again, we're coming back to the reasons why they, they bow so much to the US. Um, uh, it has also been argued that uh, that it is NATO that maybe helps keep Europeans from each other's throats, as they historically have been uh, in the past. Maybe. I'm not sure I believe that, but it, it, there may be some truth to it. But beyond that, I think I think you're right, Pascal, that there I, I don't want to get into conspiratorial attitude, but I would say that organizations like the State Department, like CIA, um, and perhaps certain kind of ideological think tanks, if you will, are able to put, put forth a certain line on contemporary issues that are picked up by mainstream media. And maybe a lot, many, many journalists have commented that contemporary journalists are quite a bit lazier than they were in the past. There's much less digging around into what's really going on, independent journalism. It's it's just easier to take it from the State Department briefing and, and uh, who's gonna know the difference anyway. So the alternative media, I think are an increasingly uh, threatened uh, population as you, you, you yourself are, are, are well aware. I also think it gets into something bigger. I have this nasty feeling that the world, the Western world anyway, is moving towards some kind of political order. I don't know what the best word, for want of a better word, I would call it fascism, but I don't mean this in a derogatory sense. I mean it more perhaps in the Italian sense uh, of a, of a cooperation or coordination or conjunction of interest between corporate corporate life and government life. And I think that was quite evident. Uh, whatever, you know, whatever the bad things that Mussolini did, I mean, there, 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 there was clear that there was a, a, a joining of the corporate with the, with the political. And I fear that that is now becoming more uh, likely. It's also, as, as the American media, become narrower. The, they are purchased by ever smaller groups of, of rich men, the New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, uh, many others are owned by single individuals, which makes centralized control far easier. You then have these very disturbing things like um, the um, 
uh, I forget the word that's used. You, you'll think of it or I will think of it too. Truth squads um, of trying to identify uh, false news, faux news, misinformation, disinformation. That's a very, very scary thing. Hey, um, the I, fact checkers. And fact checkers, and that's right. I mean, there are, there are very few lies out there. It all depends on which facts you choose to interpret and which facts you tend to lay, give weight um, to. So I can see that, you know, already men, I mean, I don't know about uh, X or New York Times, or but I mean, already I think there are organizations trying to make sure, I mean, when we even have these debates, when there are fact checkers uh, going on at the same time, it's getting harder and harder, I think, to, to, to speak independently and government having a greater voice over, I mean, even recently, I think Congress was trying to pass some kind of act that uh, to make it a crime or a felony or whatever, to make certain kinds of criticisms of Israel. I think in Germany, there are such laws on the books, perhaps right now. I'm not, I'm not positive, but, but anyway, all I'm saying is that there is a greater degree of state control and yeah. into which the media is buying uh, and, and, and supporting in their, in their own way. Europe may be even worse off I know less about it than you do. And you would feel it. You would feel it more closely in your own very fine, independent manner. It seems to me that we are at this moment where the, the true autocrats, the true people who feel that they are the only ones who have a right to interpret what's going on, are selling us, uh, are selling us, downselling us into some form of... Uh, of autocracy light under the banner of protecting freedom and and everything <laughs> you know the way pretty much in a very similar way in which uh, um in which during covid the political crackdown all came in the under the un, under the banner of protection right and i mean whether or not that was right is is like out of the question right it's the, it comes protection you, we are we are being protected into like little compartmentalized <laughs> cells, protected away, um, and protected from certain kinds of information. Yeah, because because I mean, how if people suddenly start developing their own ideas? I mean, no, we must protect them from bad ideas, right? <laughs> so that's that's very important. Um, Graham, but the problem um, is the the problem is uh, Pascal that it is easier than ever for state instruments and media instruments to control these things. Probably 20, 30 years ago, before the internet and things of this sort, much more difficult to try to exert that kind of centralized control, but it's become, become quite quite easy now with, uh, with uh, online, online media and government control of this, of this media. Yeah, which is why we are all watching what's happening to YouTube and disinformation space here, right? One of these places where where discussions are possible, um, albeit with a lot of asterisks to it. Um, Graham, um, any any one more topic that you wanted to talk about? Because otherwise, we are nearing the fifty minutes. We we already surpassed the fifty minute mark. If people want to read from you, your where where can they find you? Your blog is where. Well, I have unfortunately stopped my regular blog. I have had several, maybe 10 years of blogging, uh, many of which are sort of broader commentaries on geopolitical issues, which was at grahamefuller.com. Um, there, so there's a long, long, many years of, of blogging of that sort. More recently, I've been, I'm afraid, lazy in my own right and simply sending it to Chaz Freeman, who has a a very fine mailing list of his own. Um, I should perhaps get back into the business of doing, but anyway, Grammy Fuller will take you back into many, many back issues, many of which are still quite relevant to today. And then on uh, Chas Freeman's um, um, salon uh, listserv, uh, I, Chaz, Chaz regularly carries my stuff when I send it to him. I'll put all of that into the description of this video. Graham Fuller, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Pascal, and for posing some really very uh, provocative and interesting questions. Thank you.